Good evening. My name is Natalia Fedorshak, and I am a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that live with these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event. Can you still have fun in search of the good life in a broken world? As a member of Generation Z, I have grown up in a world where changing dynamics in all senses of life, society, and culture have shifted the expectations and guidelines by which we live. The years 2020 to 2022 have marked a time of rapid and unprecedented change for many people, resulting in a generation of growing adolescents learning to navigate and establish themselves in times of hardship and, tra and transformation. With the immeasurable loss and disorder that occurred following the COVID-19 pandemic, the high-profile police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and the following calls for the restructuring of the American law enforcement, and the mounting climate crisis as well, all within the last three years, there has been a reformation of what many Americans define to be the good life. For many Americans, there is an undeniable pursuit of joy, purpose, and growth in a world of injustice, crisis, and loss. Shifting of the age-old definition of an all-American life challenges a system that many Americans have been fighting and navigating against for decades. Remodeling what it means to contribute to your community is a major tenet of American life today. Today, we will discuss how the pursuit of a good life balances individualism in times of injustice, and how Katerina Yergil Burdell has shaped her, shaped her life experiences. Katerina Yergil Burdell is the head of the Social Impact and Environmental, Social and Governance ESG divisions at the Hershey Company. Yergil Burdell is an alumna of Dickinson College, class of 2001, as well as Emory University, where she has received her master's in theological studies. Having spent more than a decade in Washington, D.C., working for the nonprofit sector in grant writing and administration, today, Yergil Burdell focuses on advertising, product, and operation consulting for numerous companies, in addition to her work at the Hershey Company. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speakers and everyone in the audience, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. For students interested in participating in the Passport program, please scan the QR code on the back of your program to track your attendance through Engage. For more information on the pa pa passport program, please take a passport with you as you exit the auditorium. At this time, I ask you please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. In the event of an emergency, please know that a handicap accessible exit is located on the west side of the building. And now, please join me in welcoming our guest, Katrina Yergil Burdell. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Katrina Burdell. Um, really, really lovely to see you. And Natalia, thank you for that introduction. And thank you especially for the opportunity to connect tonight. Can you all hear me OK? OK, good. So first, a confession. I'm not a professional speaker by any means, not a life coach or anything along these lines. And as much as I'd love to tell you otherwise, I'm no credentialed expert when it comes to living or even defining the good life. I'm an ordinary person with an ordinary career and an ordinary life. But what I can tell you tonight is that I feel extraordinarily privileged to reflect on the idea of the good life, challenged by the opportunity to share both what has guided me in my pursuit of the good life and some of the challenges and conflicts I've felt along the way. And while I've studied religion and philosophy in undergrad here at Dickinson and in graduate school, tonight will be a lot less academic, more practical and experiential in nature. I'm hopeful that what I share with you tonight can help you as you navigate life after college or wherever you are in life at the moment. 
And if it doesn't, I hope it prompts you to think about what it is that guides you and sustains you in your own good life. Okay, so show of hands, how many of you knows exactly what the good life is? Okay, maybe one tentative hand. So it's a topic that has been around since the earliest times, with philosophers weighing in over centuries. Yet at the same time, it remains a concept unique and multifaceted, just as unique and multifaceted as we are. And that's why I was intrigued, not to mention very much daunted, when Professor Mark Aldrich, who couldn't be with us here tonight, he's homesick, asked me to consider giving this talk, knowing that if any one of us were to stand up and share reflections on the good life, we would each have our own defi different definitions, entry points, and reasons for sharing what we do. So as I mentioned, it was Professor Mark Aldrich of the Spanish Department who invited me to speak here. While I have lots of memories of Mark from studying abroad during my junior year um, in Malaga, Spain, um, and also studying with his wife, Asun, who is here tonight, there's this one story that comes to mind um, that I wanted to start out with tonight. It touches on one of the big topics we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but it also touches on grief and loss. So I just wanted, in case anyone is going through that right now, wanted to be sensitive and share that in advance. But anyway, it was January. I had just returned to Spain for second semester, um, right before spring semester, after being home in Pennsylvania over winter break. We had just finished a welcome back dinner at Mark and Asun's house in Malaga, catching up on everyone's holidays. Some people had traveled through Europe over the holidays. I went home to spend time with family. Others stayed in Malaga with their host families to experience a real Spanish Navidad season. But as everyone was leaving the apartment, I stayed behind. I stayed behind because I couldn't share that what happened to me and my biggest news over winter break was that I lost my stepsister to suicide. When I shared, with, shared this with Mark and Asun, I was grappling with how on earth I could start my second semester, my spring semester, one I had been looking forward to for so long when it felt like the world had gone dark. My parents had still urged me to go, knowing that they didn't want me to give up on that experience. But I had no roadmap for how to do that, how to move forward. And I'm really grateful for Mark and Asun's kindness and compassion during that incredibly vulnerable time. Um, and also their empathy and presence throughout that semester as I attempted to navigate life without a roadmap. So while that is a really heavy memory that I'm starting out with, I'm also smiling a little bit because if I had known in that moment that 20 years later Mark would be asking me to give a talk on the good life, I would have looked at you like you were a bit crazy. Um, because I never would have believed it. In that moment, I could not be see beyond the heaviness of my world. And I was feeling so much inner conflict, wanting and knowing I was supposed to fully enjoy and experience that semester and be present for it. Yet also, somehow, the pain of the grief, um, it all weighed so heavy on me that I had no idea how to move forward. How could I focus on myself at a time like that? So that was my first big experience with grief um, as a young, a young adult in all its complexity. It was also the first time I grappled in a big way with that sense of inner conflict. I know it's always there in life to some degree, but I'm talking about kind of a conflict that's next level. Not just the, oh, should I go do something and live for myself, but really overwhelming, paralyzing um, types of conflict. Moments like that, whether it's personal trauma or even just times like we're living through right now, times when it feels like we have collective loss from a pandemic, witnessing what feels like injustice after injustice when we watch the news. The weight of the world can feel crushing, and it can make our desire to enjoy life or pursue whatever version of our good life may be feel selfish. So we all do have this incredible gift as humans to be able to hold conflicting emotions and even viewpoints at the same time. On good days, that can feel a little bit confusing to sort through and sit with, and on our worst days, it can feel overwhelming. It's that conflict of knowing in your soul that you were built as a human to experience joy and love and wonder and pleasure, even as we're forced to weather and witness intense hardship. 
even as we may feel called to labor against injustice or confront darkness, however you may define darkness. We may feel called to serve others or strive for the common good, and at the same time, feel equally called to follow our own bliss. How do you reconcile that? So as I mentioned, those are philosophical and ethical questions that go way back. And as much as I'd love to detour this conversation to ancient Greece, I'll save that for those of you who are philosophy majors and minors. Um, but I'll ask you to hold that question instead and just sit with it. Don't try to answer it. Just hold on to it. We'll get back there. And instead of going all the way back to ancient Greece, I'm going to take you a little bit back in time and just tell you a little about myself and what happened in my life after that year in Malaga. So after studying abroad and graduating from Dickinson, I really wasn't sure what to do. I was leaving with double majors in Spanish and religion, no specific career goal in mind. I thought I would work for maybe a year or two, maybe go to law school. I ended up in Washington, DC, with a first job working as a legal assistant um, at a large law firm, doing legal research, reviewing documents and cases. But a few months after that job started in 2001, the September 11th attacks happened. And in the months that followed, I learned two big things about myself. First, I learned what I loved working on. I had the chance at that law firm to work on employment discrimination cases, helping women that were systematically denied advancement opportunities that weren't awarded the same compensation as their male colleagues. I was also assigned to several pro bono cases working with victims of the Pentagon attacks, burn victims whose lives and whose families' lives were forever changed. I helped them share their stories before the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, doing everything I could to get them as much support as they could get. I realized that with those types of projects, where I was making a difference in people's lives, where I was maybe making the world just a little bit more just, it absolutely like lit me up. The second thing I learned during that time frame was that I really did not want to become a lawyer. <laughs> um, September 11th was also formative in one other big way for me as well. In the months that followed, I watched America become increasingly xenophobic, increasingly divided. That concerned me. It felt like we were sliding backwards as a culture and as a country. Maybe that sounds a little familiar today. But as a recent grad who studied um, world religions at Dickinson, who spent a lot of time learning about dialogue and fostering understanding across cultures, I thought that maybe I could help somehow. So I started applying to religion programs, was offered a full scholarship at Emory University, where I studied American religious practices. Now, for those of you who are majoring in religion or philosophy, um, I empathize because I know what it's like to get a lot of questions from your family. So just imagine what I got from mine as I told them I was getting my grad degree at a divinity school. I wish I could tell you that my career path after that was linear, but there I was, fresh graduate degree in theology, having a hard time finding jobs in the nonprofit community at organizations that were focused on making America a more inclusive and understanding place. I thought about staying on for my PhD, but knew that that really wasn't in the cards for me. I missed working, I missed helping others. So while I felt personally prepared to help foster understanding and dialogue, there weren't that many jobs out there to pay the bills um, in that area. So I got pragmatic on my next steps. Knowing I would probably be working at nonprofits or in a university setting over the long haul rather than say the business world, I decided I should get good at raising money. So I started off my nonprofit career in fundraising, learning firsthand how hard it is to write grants, to report back on impact and progress, how to cultivate donors at foundations and companies, how to host events, engage celebrities to support your cause. Not gonna lie, fundraising is not for the faint of heart. And I knew after a few years that it wasn't my forever job. So while I got pretty good at it, I knew I was not gonna stay. I began thinking about what was next, and right around that same time, some of the donors that I had built trust with began asking me questions about other issues they cared about. Where else might they give? How else might they make a bigger impact? And as I started informally advising them, I realized that that might be another way to make a difference. 
That led me to a small consulting company in DC that did exactly that. Who knew that there'd be a place like that? But um, I ended up working at this place that advised foundations and families, entrepreneurs and companies on how to be more strategic with their giving. I had the opportunity to launch and incubate nonprofit projects, some that are now really amazing nonprofits today, um, as well as launching collaborations among donors to help them collaborate more effectively and participatory grant making efforts that engaged community members in solving the issues in their own communities. I had a lot of projects at the same time and I learned how to quickly get up to speed on a wide range of issues and learned from change makers focused on education, climate change, election reform, human rights, ending gun violence, and all sorts of other critical issues. Working in that environment was incredibly demanding, but I loved the work because I could help inch each one of those movements forward a little bit and learned a ton along the way. After about five years of advising in philanthropy, I was asked to consider a role at the Hershey Company, running their philanthropic programs, corporate giving programs, and social impact. As I said before, I never in a million years thought I would work for a big company, but I was intrigued by the challenge and the opportunity to help a company that was 125 years, ago, years old hopefully operate for the better. In my last six years at Hershey, I've had the chance to make slow and steady progress on that front. I'm really excited about the commitments we're making. You know we have tons to do uh, related to climate, related to all sorts of issues. But in my role, I've also had the chance to work closely with our employees, learn more about what they care about and the issues their communities are facing. I've been able to develop deep partnerships with nonprofits, as well as work with our brand teams, Kit Kat and Reese's and Hershey's, on how they can more authentically raise awareness and make a difference on issues. As someone without an MBA, I can also say I've had a big crash course in business these past few years. So I shared that deep dive on my career, not because it's a roadmap to end up where I am today, for those of you who are still in school, um, because if working in social impact or corporate sustainability or philanthropy is your goal, there are a lot more direct ways to get there. But instead, I hope that my meandering journey opens you up to possibilities for your own career path. It doesn't need to be linear. And whatever you learn a lot about yourself along the way, you can use to move forward. And I hope that that's part of your being your guide as you explore your own version of the good life. So now speaking of the good life, we asked earlier what it was, not too many hands. Curious to know how many of you feel today that you're living the good life right now? Okay, good, I see, even if you don't know how to define it, there's a handful of, a handful of hands, I love that. Um, how many of you who didn't put your hands up feel like maybe it's something to work towards, something maybe attainable someday in the future? Yeah, some more hands there too. So I believe that the concept of the good life shouldn't be something that we attain. I don't see it as a destination we arrive at, if we're lucky, at some indefinite time in the future. Instead, I believe that each one of us can begin to access it right now. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about how I do that. We can try it together in a minute. So we often hear growing up that life is what you make of it. You can be the architect of your own life. What I experienced in my childhood growing up, and this is probably true of many of you, I had little control over my circumstances. I had parents who worked really hard, who struggled to make ends meet. They still did everything they could to take care of us and give us every opportunity that, we, that they could. They did what they could to get through each day safely, get to the next paycheck, get us one year closer to graduation. We had lots of memories along the way as a family, but life really felt like it just happened to us. I'm sure others feel that way as well about their childhoods. So it really wasn't until after I graduated from Dickinson this idea of living my life with more intention started to kind of take hold. It started to hit me on a deeper level. And as I began making my own money, living on my own, trying to figure out what to do after that first law firm job, that's when I realized that I could design my own life. And that felt daring and thrilling and revolutionary for someone who'd never really tried that before. It also felt super daunting you can probably tell based on what little you've heard from me so far is that I'm not the kind of person who has a checklist of specific goals in mind for life. 
In fact, I hate to admit it, but for especially for young people in the audience, I have had a really hard time formulating and articulating concrete goals for myself, even from an early age. I draw a blank when teachers or guidance counselors or advisors would say, what are your goals? I would really not know what to say. So what still works for me instead, instead of that checklist or a list of things I want to do or that I want to accomplish, instead of doing that, I have this practice of asking big questions and kind of holding on to them, not rushing to answer them, but just sitting with them for a little bit. You'll hear this theme of questions come up throughout my talk tonight because I do believe that our lives are shaped by the questions we ask ourselves and how we sit and engage with them over time. So anyway, the big question that I hold close, the one that's helped me get closer to what I believe the good life is for me, that helped me start accessing it immediately, was what do I want my life to feel like? How do I want to feel as I walk through life each day? So I know this isn't a workshop per se, but I do want to invite each of you to pause just for a few minutes, maybe one minute. And instead of thinking about what you want to do in life, no matter what stage of life you're in, I want you to think about how you want to feel. What feelings come to mind? You can write them down, jot them down in your phone, just put them in your brain. But I want you to really think about how do I want to feel in my life? And I also want you to notice how your body feels when you imagine yourself feeling that way. So just take a moment. I think Kevin might put on some music, maybe so. Um, but we'll just do a quick minute of reflection. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Good music. So think about the feelings. I feel like I should stop right there when the music stops. Okay, so that was about a minute. Um, everyone have a feeling in mind? Something to kind of work from? Okay, so where I landed for my good life feeling was a feeling of meaningful connection. That is really, for me, a big one of those big feelings that I wanted to feel. And I wanted to feel meaningfully connected with others, but also to a sense of purpose or something bigger than myself really important to me to feel connected to my world. And last, I really wanted to feel connected to my spiritual self, what some people may describe as the divine within, just some sort of spiritual connection. Knowing this, though, I was able to check in with myself as opportunities arose and as I navigated my life. So I could see how I felt in my heart and in my core as every choice unfolded before me. I could know whether that was leading me toward that feeling or away from that feeling. It helped me realize that I could be my own guide, and it also lets me know when I'm drifting further away from that feeling of a good life. By asking the question of how I want to feel and checking in with that feeling throughout my life, it ended up leading me through all those stages through my career and social impact that you heard about. It also helped me nurture my relationships and friendships that felt meaningful to me leading me to my partner of 22 years. It also helped me seek out communities where I felt a sense of belonging. That feeling and that question um, also led me to learn how to meditate, to connect with nature regularly, and to develop a faith practice, all things that helped me connect to that still place within. And even though my life is very ordinary, you will probably not see me featured in Dickinson Magazine or anything along those lines, I feel that the good life is something that I've been living because I've been living it with intention. And on the whole, my life aligns with that feeling that I want to feel. Does life still happen to me? Absolutely. Do I get it right all the time? No way. But by thinking about the good life as a feeling, an experience that's rooted in the body and the heart right now, rather than a, an idea or a destination for the future, I'm able to feel my way towards it each day. 
So I'm just gonna pause for one more minute and please indulge me. Um, and just ask you to think about a couple things that you might do to get you closer to that feeling that you had in mind earlier. Are there experiences that you wanna seek out, activities to undertake, things you wanna prioritize that help you feel closer to that feeling you wanna feel in life? So just take a minute and uh, think about that. Thanks everybody for doing that thinking. And the question of how I wanna feel in life, just one more point I wanna make about it. That question also became helpful to me as I moved through new roles and life stages. So as the idea of a good life evolved from just my good life, it took a meaning beyond my own life. For example, when I became a parent, I felt super overwhelmed in the beginning of parenthood caring for a baby. And even now, the emotional and mental load that comes with parenthood, it's intense. I can see now why it was really hard for my parents to create any sort of intentional home life or family life together when they were trying to juggle so much. But a couple years into my life as a new parent, I tweaked that question slightly to apply to my shared life with my family um, and had a conversation with my husband where our question together became, how do we want our home to feel as we raise our kids? What do we hope our children will feel as they grow up? That question has helped us not only to care for our kids day to day, but also to begin intentionally creating the type of family environment that was important to us beyond simply taking care of kids day to day, because you know what happens. You kind of get stuck and things happen. Um, but really, we were able to seek out experiences together as a family that would help us reinforce that feeling we were looking for. You can do this in other life stages, when you start a relationship with someone, when you start to manage a team, when you're a teacher in a classroom. You can ask, how do I want my students to feel, my team to feel? I think when you're more intentional about the feelings you wanna create, whether that's inside yourself or others, you can begin to access and align with a good life or a shared life together right now. So what you heard in my idea of a good life the feelings I wanna have, meaningful connection, working towards something bigger and a connection to the world, and a connection to my spiritual center. That did help guide my career choices and, and life choices, big and small for sure. But it also brings me to the part of the story that I did not tell. And I think it might be the part that you're all here tonight. Um, the one that brings us back around to that question I asked you to hold at the beginning. Remember that one you were sitting with? So what I shared with you about my life thus far, you did not hear about me being overwhelmed by the problems of the world, burnt out by the never ending work on issues that feel like they're unsolvable, burnt out by a sector that underworks, or sorry, overworks and undervalues talented people who give their all to a cause. If you ask any nonprofit worker, you know what that's like. Um, or just feeling burnt out in general, you know, living through a pandemic, in my case, spending two years with no reliable childcare, losing loved ones to COVID, or just generally living through what feels like some of the biggest challenges, societal, political, global, of our time. I hope you've heard this before, but it's completely understandable to feel burnt out and challenged by the times we're living through. I've felt it on and off through my career, and even though I'm not a frontline activist, the work that I do and even my just desire as a, a human to be engaged with the world requires me to be present, to witness that pain and injustice, and to be soft enough to care. That can be really exhausting. I know what it's like to feel spent and hopeless when it feels like the world is just getting darker, when it feels like we're moving backwards on critical issues, when it feels like maybe democracy is crumbling, what we thought were hard-won human rights now eroding or under threat. 
and when it feels like the concept of truth is up for grabs. It can make you feel like giving up or escaping, going numb, pouring a drink, walking away and saying it's not my problem. I definitely tried to do that quite a few times. But every time I did, I felt that feeling again, that I was moving away from that feeling of connection that was so central to my idea of the good life. I knew it wasn't sustainable to react and respond that way. Another response that can be pretty common is a sense of urgency on the issues you care about. That, that sense of urgency can be near paralyzing. Whatever the issue may be, whether it's personal trauma, grief, or loss, or a big setback for a movement, when that happens, it can feel all-consuming. It can take everything out of you. You're afraid, and you're stuck, and you have this feeling that's like, how can I possibly do whatever? Go out to dinner, water the tomatoes, enjoy my life. How can I do any of that when the world is burning? It feels like you're living in a world that's a nightmare you can't wake up from. There's definitely a strong sense that whatever it is you should be doing, having fun is definitely not gonna help. Has anyone else felt that way before? Yeah. So I've definitely felt that a lot lately, so much so that it wakes me up at night, keeps me from focusing on my work, takes me away from being present with my children, takes me away from being present in my life. So here we are back to that tension we talked about, that conflict. How can I possibly pursue my own joy when the world is burning, when the world is broken? I've been sitting with that question, various iterations of it throughout my life. Somewhere between my heart and my gut, I realized that the more deeply I engaged with it, the more I was able to explore it from different and new angles. And the more I was able to ask whether I was framing that question correctly. So a few weeks ago, Finland's prime minister made headlines because a video of her emerged dancing and just letting loose at a party. She's 36 years old, and her opposition accused her of not taking her job seriously enough. So women around the world began posting videos of themselves dancing in solidarity. And the cultural conversation became a lot about whether a young woman could enjoy being young while simultaneously leading her country and doing a good job. The commentary, of course, also centered on the double standards that women face in leadership. That's all true and important. But I'd like us to think for a minute about the role that seeking out moments of joy and delight plays in our ability to be of service of others, to work towards change, or even just to heal ourselves. Why are we so hard on ourselves or others for seeking those moments of joy out? What if we saw joy and following our bliss not as in conflict with our responsibility to others in the world, but actually in service of it? And why does it seem like those in power want to do everything they can to take joy away from those they want to control? I think the answer is pretty simple. Joy is incredibly powerful. So I'd be remiss before I went any further if I didn't connect this conversation, this connection between joy and social change movements with the incredibly rich body of work that black women in particular have led for generations now related to this. Abolitionist and women's rights advocate Sojourner Truth said, long, long time ago, I will not allow the light of my life to be determined by the darkness around me. Black feminist and poet Toy Derricotte wrote, joy is an act of resistance, and we hear that everywhere now. It is kind of the mantra of our times, it resonates now more than ever. That phrase, though, is liberating to black women. They used it to claim not just their grit and labor and hardship and suffering, but also their joy and laughter and celebration as central to their fight against white supremacy. Even more recently, author Adrienne Marie Brown, just in 2019, wrote a book called Pleasure Activism, exploring the concept at length, talking about how working to change the world doesn't have to be devoid of pleasure and joy and delight. That's a topic I strongly recommend diving into, and um, th that connection between joy and change, the role it plays in countering oppression and injustice is fascinating. 
But I'm gonna jump back to my own life just for a moment as we talk through and explore this concept of joy in a little more detail. So for me, one of the things that brings me the most joy is dancing and experiencing live music. I've been seeing this one band in particular every chance I get for more than 25 years. Those who know me are laughing. Um, but that sounds crazy, I know. But I've learned that taking time out and connecting to that deep joy brings me so much ability to move forward in all other aspects of my life. People have asked me why I see their shows more than a dozen times a year, why I fly across the country to see them, why I watch their live streams on nights when I'm not able to be there on per in person. And I could talk your ear off on the music and the lyrics, the improvisation, the subculture of fans, the best versions of songs, the venues. But more than anything, it's the experience that comes from connecting to that music and dancing in community with others that feels like something sacred to me, something magical. It allows me to feel in tune and in sync and in the moment, free of time. It's hard to describe, but I think, and I'm pretty sure that's pure joy. So even moments that are brief and fleeting, like observing a hummingbird or driving down the road and having your favorite song come on, those can be transformational and sustain you. Other activities can put you in moments of real flow, like you just heard about, dancing for three hours at a fish show, running and biking for some people, being in nature, walking, laughing with friends, being present with loved ones, actually being present, fully present, doing anything, even the most ordinary things, can bring us joy. So whatever it may be, big or small, we're gonna do this again. I want you to make a small list of a few things that you know bring you joy. Maybe they light you up like they light me up when I was talking about music. Um, or maybe they're just tiny moments you experience today. Whatever that is, think of one or two things, maybe three or four that bring you joy. But whatever it is, think about the things that make you feel amazingly alive, in tune with yourself or the world or the universe, fully present. Can you think of something? We'll just put the music on for one minute. Everybody have a couple joyful things? Okay. So I asked you to do that because when I was sharing my notes for this talk with a group of women that I connect with each month, these are all women who work in social change. We meet monthly to learn about different issues and support one another's work. One of them said to me, hey, I love what you're saying, but I also want you to know how lucky you are. You know what brings you joy and what you're passionate about, and you prioritize that every chance you get. I don't even know what brings me joy anymore, she said. And I know that when we're really in the thick of that darkness, feeling completely overwhelmed, it can be hard to remember. It can be very easy to forget to be present for joy, even the smallest moments of it. So if you'll indulge me for one last time, turn to the person next to you or near you and just for one, one brief minute, share one or two things that made you joyful. Um, because by sharing this, it might help someone else who feels stuck. There's also one other reason why we're sharing, which I'll share in a moment. So share away. Thank you. 
applause and just start again in just like 20 seconds. I'm seeing a lot of smiles in the room. That's great. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing and being willing to share with one another. So joy not only fuels us, fuels our spirits and sustains us during tough times, but in joy we find connection and camaraderie. We no longer feel isolated and alone, which by the way is exactly how those who are against change want you to feel. In moments of joy and celebration, we reconnect with that fundamental goodness of being human. And feeling even a fleeting moment of joy can bring us hope, and that hope fuels us forward. And even recounting a joyful moment with others, simply by sharing that it happened or getting excited about it all over again, can help others access joy. Because when you're fully present and watching someone else experience joy, that can bring you joy as well. And I think we just saw some of that a moment ago. Did you notice someone light up when they told you? Yeah. So for me, joy is essential medicine, helping me overcome the fear and paralysis and burnout that comes from working day after day for change when the challenges are great and the issues are hard. I think seeking it out is not selfish, but instead it helps me engage more deeply with the world around me, helps me stay connected to the moment and to the people around me. So joy is a critical element of the good life for me, not a conflict. And I believe that we're more effective when we take action from a place of joy. If I can respond to the challenges from that place of joy with hope and delight for the world I wanna create, for the world I think my children deserve, I know I can make a better impact and a greater impact than if I were responding from a place of fear or weakness or anger. My joy and my work Sorry, my work is better when I allow joy in. So as I wrap up today, I wanna to thank you guys so much for sharing, for your attention, and for being with me as I stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit to share my thoughts on the good life. I hope that we can all be more intentional about creating the life we want for ourselves, using the question of how we wanna to feel to guide us as we move through our lives, our careers, our relationships with others, I hope we don't think of the good life as something far off in the future, something to aspire to or arrive at, but instead as something that can be accessed now. And I hope that we get comfortable with sitting with questions, not rushing to answer them, holding them and engaging with them over and over again, returning to them and reframing them as we move through our lives. And I hope that this talk makes very clear that yes, you absolutely can and should still have fun I endorse doing so, um, especially when you're burnt out, overwhelmed, overtaken by darkness. But even when you're not, joy should be a regular practice because we can't live the good life if we're not present for it. And joy requires presence. So in our moments of darkness, may we all find at least small ways to experience joy. May we prioritize it without guilt or shame, a lesson my parents knew I needed long before I did. May we all be open enough to experience wonder and adventure. May we take that trip, even as our hearts are breaking. May it no longer be about whether or not to seek joy when the world is broken, but instead may we seek joy because the world is broken. Because without dancing, we can't fight, we can't serve. And may our joy make us stronger, help us live a good life, not only for ourselves, but in connection with the world. May it help us move forward without fear and stay soft enough to care. So thank you guys so much tonight. Really appreciate being in connection with you and um, happy to answer questions, but also just happy for dialogue if you wanna share any responses that you may have. I think these awesome ladies are happy to share the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now begin the question and answer portion of tonight's program. Because this event is being recorded, if you would just raise your hand and wait for a microphone to reach you prior to asking any questions, we will get that to you. The first question is reserved for students, if any of you have questions. And if not, we will then open it up to everyone else in attendance. And with that, we are looking for our first question. That's okay, here we go. 
I'm a student from many years ago. No, <laughs> lifelong student. Uh, Katrina, that was awesome. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And I think um, the question I have for you are, is twofold. One is, um, how do you frame your practice? One, around informed activism and social issues, like you mentioned, the group that you're a part of. And also, how, if you feel comfortable sharing, like, can you share about your practice of sustaining joy on a regular basis? Sure. So the first question, I think I'm not exactly sure exactly what, you, what you're um, looking for, but I'm happy to share a little bit more. So from a change perspective, I do think being in community with others and being um, in connection with others who maybe if it's not on the same issue that you can come back to um, having some sort of place where you can learn together and share your challenges together. I think it's very hard to go it alone when you're working for change. Um, and that's how movements work is, is in community and hopefully as communities link together, change can happen. But in my case, there's a, a group of women from across the country, we meet once a month, first Friday of every month. And um, we, it started out actually going right before the pandemic hit, we were all in a um, leadership course together and we realized that we all had work to do around um, learning about confronting white supremacy as white women in our fields. And we actually met monthly to talk through different issues and really work on that together. Um, and we've been meeting now for over two and a half years but the conversation has also evolved into all sorts of um, support for one another as we encounter and, and work towards change in our different fields. So we're all in, so in philanthropy and social uh, change, but some folks are working on healthcare issues, some folks are working um, on education, some on anti-racism, all different issues, but we're able to kind of be in community with each other and support one another. So that's been a huge part of my practice. Um, and then as far as the joy piece goes, mindfulness has been a huge just part of my, of my journey um, and spiritual path. So just being present and, and reminding myself throughout the day to be present um, has just been what works for me. Yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you for the talk, it was very motivating. Um, so my question is, is well, I'm still very young, you know, um, and so I don't, also don't fully know what it is I wanna set my intention towards, or like, yeah, work towards. Um, and I understand what you mean by that feeling, but um, I think, a lot of people my age struggle with like knowing exactly what it is that brings out that kind of energy um, and that kind of motivation for youth's dancing. Um, and so like when you don't know that, um, what are the steps that you can take to try and find that and to try and, you know, slowly, incrementally, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, that's a great question. I think there's kind of two pieces to it too from what I heard. So I think that feeling, whatever it is you wanna feel in life, that might change over time and as you move through life. Um, it doesn't have to be the same thing. So right now if what you feel, you know, what you're feeling or wanna feel as you're navigating life as a student or a young adult, know that that doesn't have to be the constant throughout your life. Come back to it and shift it over time. Um, so that feeling, I think there's no right answer. It just can be how you want to feel today um, or this month or, or right through for this phase of your life. But the other kind of part of your question around knowing what you might be passionate about or knowing what really fuels you or brings you joy, it is hard. I spent many, many years of my life kind of knowing that I loved that but not really connecting it to the other pieces of my life, that, that experience of music. Um, so I would say start small. Like if there are just tiny things that light you up, even if it's just like looking at nature or enjoying time with a book or being with friends, um, reminding yourself to be fully present for that, not distracted by other things. Um, I think that that's how you open yourself to more and more of knowing what that feeling is and that feeling of being kind of in that moment or in flow. Um, it starts small, so I would just say. 
stay start small and don't don't feel like you need some big thing. Yeah. Thank you. Follow up question. Go ahead. Um, this is a bit different, but um, I have been thinking like as a way to make change. Like there are areas, let's say in nonprofit um, in a nonprofit company. You enter a nonprofit company, and they're all working towards making better change. Um, and I wonder, like, can you make more change by banding with other people who are also working towards that, or entering a field that's maybe doesn't have that many people, and you rather try and change the people in that kind of community um, to like gather them? And yeah, I mean, that's it's a great. There are different. I think different issues are kind of at different stages. So if there's an issue that you really care about that there is not, say, an existing organization or community of people. Um, I have a friend who's, um, whose mother was raising a child who had a very rare disease, for example, and she ended up creating a community of people and of parents who also, you know, as she found those other people across the country and around the world, brought them together and they could advocate for their children and advocate for more research and change that. Um, but she, for a long, long time, felt alone and thought that she was maybe one of the only people addressing that. So there are different ways, but I, do, I don't think you can make sustain long-term change without bringing others along. Um, and a lot of the best movements, especially the ones that we're seeing today, bring issues together so you can fight for climate justice as you fight for human rights and, and equity um, and racial justice because those are all issues that intersect with one another. And I think that that's what we're seeing more and more of is seeing that interconnection between issues um, to really create change across um, a bigger movement than just seeing it as isolated, uh, disconnected issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks for your yeah. talk, Katrina. I really appreciated it. Um, I heard you use the term fully present a, full time, a few times. Yeah. And um, I found that, this is kind of a comment plus a question together, but I found that um, I'm able to be more fully present in life when my phone isn't a part of things, um, either intentionally or unintentionally, yes. you know, intentional times where I just kind of leave it in my purse and then times where I'm doing something where I just sort of forget about it for hours are the best because it's just, you know, I'm there in the moment with the people who are with me, not worried about, mm -hmm. you know, who's messaging me or what's happening on my phone. And so I was just wondering, has that been a part of your practice at all in choosing to be fully present at times? How do you incorporate that? How do you deal with that? How do you grapple with sort of the technology constant yeah. distraction issue in your own practice of choosing joy? Yeah, that is such a good question, and it's a huge challenge. I wish I could say that I have a practice of like putting my phone down or turning it off. Um, I don't, and my children will tell you that I don't, um, and they will say, Mom, put your phone down. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that steals you from being present, um, for sure, and it's, I think it's something we all need to work on. But yeah, it's a really good point, because I do think part of this feel, that feeling of paralysis and overwhelm is also being constantly bombarded, whether you're on social media or getting messaged or checking news, by all of that all the time, that you don't ever really kind of get a moment to check in with yourself um, or to be with the world. So yeah, it's a, I think it, it works against us more often than not. I would just recommend too for the, um, the girl back there who asked that question, like. What is it that you do that you forget about your phone and you forget about what else is yeah. going on and you're just kind of lost in the moment? Those might be the things that are bringing you joy, like where you're not concerned about that and you're able to be fully present. Maybe that might be a tip mm -hmm. for how to think about what brings you joy. That's a great, great tip. Yeah, snaps for that. Thank you very much, Katrina. I really benefited. felt like it was exactly what I need, some of those questions that you asked, so thank you. Um, I'm not from Pennsylvania originally, and when I was driving um, into the state uh, a month or two ago, I noticed on the billboard, um, Pennsylvania has a tagline of pursue your, your happiness. happiness. Yes. And uh, that might have been there for a long time, but it was 
surprising to me, and um, I'll just share briefly that it struck me as very um, selfish <laughs> and uh, limited as sort of a mantra for life or perhaps for a state. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if you could comment on it. If you yeah. completely agree with it, you can defend it. But I wonder what your comment is. What do you think the connection is to the good life? And do you think that mm. is a good uh, mantra for pursuing the good life? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I know it used to be you've got a friend in Pennsylvania until the grammar police came after the word got. But um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I haven't really thought too much because I've driven by that sign a bunch of times too. Um, I'm sure it's about just, you know, finding what makes you happy in this state. Um, cannot, cannot defend it in any way. But I do think, um, I've thought a lot about the question of happiness versus joy. And um, I think joy really is that idea of being present, um, whatever it might be, it's almost like a state of being. Um, whereas I think happiness, it's a feeling, but it usually is something that you feel happy as a result of something else. So it's more, at least for me, that's kind of the way I, I think about the difference is that when this happens, then I'll be happy. Um, sometimes then I'll not be happy or I'll move on to the next thing. Whereas I think about joy as being more of a state of mind and more of just being open to, to presence um, and to the moment regardless of what it is that happened, nothing needs to happen. It's really just being in that state of, of awareness and, and mindfulness. But that's how I kind of think of the distinction. But yeah, I can't, can't speak to the Pennsylvania motto. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, you good? Sure. Thank you. And that concludes tonight's program. Please join me in giving another big round of applause to Katrina. Bickley.